Okay. Three, two, one. Three, two, one, yeah. Good afternoon, I'm Michael Hemming, a board member here at the Cornwall Historical Society. And today we have the pleasure of hosting Stacy Vero, who is a circuit rider, if you can tell us what that is, with Preservation Connecticut, and Marina Wisniewski, who's an architectural historian at the State Historic Preservation Office. The event is being recorded by Richard Griggs, our old reliable. Preservation Connecticut was formerly known as the Connecticut Trust for Historic Preservation. Hi, come on in. Uh, it was established almost 50 years ago uh, to protect and promote buildings, sites, structures. Hi, come in. Uh, and landscapes that contribute to the heritage and vitality of the Connecticut community. The State Historic Preservation Office administers a wide range of federal and state programs that identify, register, and protect historic buildings, sites, structures, districts, objects that comprise Connecticut's architectural heritage. What is historic preservation, anyway? The National Park Service describes historic preservation as a conversation with our past about our future. Through it, we look at history and learn new things about our past and ourselves. Historic preservation is an important way for us to transmit our understanding of the past to future generations. I leave it to Stacy and Marina to tell us about sustainability. After the talk, I hope you'll have a chance to look at this. This is our current postcard show, postcards from Cornwall, Warren, and Kent. And then also we have a small show here done by Richard Klein uh, that's sort of a tribute to the iron and charcoal industry uh, of the last century. Uh, and I hope you'll also sign the guest book. Please welcome Stacy and Maria. automated mechanical heating, cooling, and ventilation systems. 
Instead, buildings incorporated a number of passive or manual features that responded to those needs. So whether rehabilitating a building for new or continuing use, or just maximizing the efficiency of your own historic home, it's important to recognize and, if possible, oops, maintain um, these features. How many did I go through? Um, <laughs> to maintain these uh, features so that they can uh, further, as you further improve your energy efficiency. So we'll begin the discussion by how to stay warm. Why is this moving all the time? Right. Um, we'll begin with orientation. So in cold climates, buildings are typically, as you can see from that diagram on the top, oriented against the northern winds, while buildings in warm climates were cited to take advantage of prevailing breezes. Here in the Northeast, you all are familiar with the salt box style home, um, which was oriented, oriented so that the long slope of the roof directed cold north wind, winds up and over the back of the house. Um, the south side of the house typically had the most windows because it had the most exposure to the sun. So the main living areas were arranged along the south side. So you'd have your parlor, your sitting area, and your main bed chambers along that front edge of the house. Um, orientation, as we see from the photo below, is not based on relation to the road in many of these older homes, but rather its relation to the sun. Another aspect that we may not think about are thick masonry walls. In the northeast, um, these walls provide thermal mass that absorbs the sun's energy during the day and transfers it very slowly to the interior over the course of the night. So this helps the interior stay cool during the day and warm in the evening as the heat works its way through the walls slowly. Walls with substantial mass also have high thermal inertia. For instance, uh, a wall with high thermal inertia subjected to solar radiation for an hour will absorb that heat at its outside surface and slowly transfer it to the interior over a period for as long as six hours. So it gets a lot of sun, slowly brings it inside. Conversely, a wall having the equivalent thermal resistance, or R value, but a substantially lower thermal inertia, will transfer the heat in perhaps as little as two hours. So insulation. This is a touchy subject. Marina is going to tell you a lot about how to properly insulate your house. But most houses built prior to 1950 do not have what we would consider to be adequate insulation. Um, all sorts of materials and methods were, however, employed. So you can see here on the right-hand side that horizontal sheathing was used to provide another barrier to the elements. That's in Williamsburg, Virginia, a very old house that was recreated there. <clears throat> Plaster and lath, um, which many of you probably have in your homes if you have a historic house, that sometimes included um, horse hair or animal hair, which upped the R value and provided an additional insulating factor. Um, I've been in houses, one, one house that I was recently in in New Canaan had corn cobs they used as insulation. Um, there was a shoe. There were, uh, there was brick knobbing, which is just little bits and pieces of brick that sometimes they would throw in. So even refuse that was considered clean refuse could be used to provide an insulating um, barrier. And as you move into the 1920s, materials like vermiculite, um, which I unfortunately had in my house and had to remediate, uh, was, is, was used. And cellulose was introduced. Cellulose is a mix of uh, newspaper and sort of fibers that settles, unfortunately, in houses very uh, solidly in, <laughs> in cavities in many cases. Um, and then finally, in the 40s, man-made materials like fiberglass bats were invented. And again, Marina will tell you how you should uh, deal with these things and improve insulation nowadays. Something that seems somewhat obvious, but older houses tended to have smaller windows. So um, this was to conserve heat. In cold climates where winter heat loss was the primary concern, windows were limited to whatever was considered enough to provide adequate light and ventilation. So in historic buildings where the ratio of glass to wall is less than 20%, potential heat loss through the windows is likely minimal. So don't replace the old windows. That's our that's the first time we say that. Um, but consequently, these, these historic buildings are inherently more energy efficient than most uh, recent construction. Another somewhat obvious um, historic feature 
is a centric chimney. So the centric chimney was used not only to provide um, a hearth, which provided direct heat and cooking source, but uh, it radiated heat throughout every story of the house, from the basement all the way up through the attic. Many older houses also allowed for areas to be closed seasonally. Um, pocket doors were used for this, and uh, my dad lived in a three-family apartment in Waterbury that was huge, but he tells me he was growing up that they would close off half of the apartment because they couldn't afford to eat at all. And that's just a practical way that people um, used to deal with staying warm. Another obvious one, low ceilings. Low ceilings were used to trap the heat coming out of these massive hearths and circulate it back around the room, um, keeping everything very close and very cozy. And the use of uh, mechanical features like shutters, curtains, and portiers, uh, <laughs> basically fancy curtains, uh, placed between rooms to again create a barrier against the cold. Now we're going to move on to uh, keeping cool and back to the thick masonry walls. This is a train station in New London. And this heavy masonry again was used for cooling as well as, as heating. Um, that high thermal inertia is the reason many older public and commercial buildings without air conditioning still feel cool in the summer. And I know a lot of our kids probably were feeling that last week when they were <laughs> in their schools. Um, but the heat from the midday sun doesn't penetrate the building until later in the afternoon, and that's when it's less occupied. Uh, shade trees. The use of shade trees is a huge uh, factor. You'll see many older homes planted with these sort of large overhanging trees that can be a problem, but um, they were planted for a reason and strategically. Evergreen trees planted on the north side of the building can shield it from winter winds and will shade it from the heat um, of the summer sun. Deciduous trees planted to the south provide summer shade and maximize sun in the winter when they've lost their leaves. And trees can also serve very importantly as a windbreak. So the introduction of porches really came about in the federal period, um, the later federal period. And here you see a number of artists from the Old Lyme colony, the summer colony in Old Lyme, um, enjoying uh, a meal on the porch. So the Victorian era is when these large sweeping wraparound porches became more prevalent and it was just a, a practical way of expanding the living space to uh, provide additional ventilation and cooling. And again, sleeping porches is another um, a way of doing that. You can see we've drawn a very helpful little arrow so you can see where the sleeping porch is on this building. But um, it's, it's just another way of maximizing ventilation and taking uh, advantage of cooling breezes in the evening. And again, practical, using shutters and blinds to limit the sun's rays during the day. If anyone has ever spent time in the south, I, I did my graduate work in Savannah or in Italy, you'll know that they actually use shutters. Uh, they close them and open them all the time to actually uh, keep the interior of these very majestic buildings uh, cool. And then windows. Um, double hung sash windows really allowed for a number of uh, options with ventilation. These people are being a little dangerous, you can see, but um, a, a, a tip that we can give you is that if you close the shutters or curtains on a hot sunny day um, on the warmer side of the house and you are opening windows on the upper level. Let me get this right, hold on a second. So you open the windows on the lower level, and then you open the upper sash on the upper level. You're creating a stack effect, and that's sort of like a free way of providing air conditioning. Another practical um, addition is to put in an attic fan. Something very simple like that can, can really sort of uh, help keep things cooler without using your AC. And another aspect of that is uh, the addition of monitors and towers. In the Victorian or Romantic period, these became very popular, not just from a decor decorative point of view, but because they do create that stack effect. They take the hot air and bring it up and out of the building. And 
in houses that were sort of more grand or larger, uh, colonial houses, the idea of creating cross ventilation or having a large center hall with doors at the front and back, this was the type of plan that was used to air the rooms out and not only create ventilation, but a good cross breeze. And again, an open plan. Um, you can see here they have a very large transom and not a full closure between uh, many of the rooms. These, these open plans allow for just a lot of uh, cross ventilation and again, just a lot of breeze. Transoms that may be more uh, familiar to you if you've gone to a public school, uh, they're always over the doors. And these things are um, not used as often as maybe they should be, but um, just opening those up can provide a tremendous amount of airflow and, um, and also just the obvious light. And conversely, uh, those nice cozy cottages with the low ceilings, many of the houses in the late 19th century began using much taller ceilings to provide uh, a, a kind of cooling effect, particularly in areas like kitchens. And speaking of kitchens, um, this is one in Shelton, an auxiliary kitchen that was built at the rear of a house. Um, we come across a tremendous number of basement kitchens as well, um, which were really used in the summer so that they didn't add that extra heat to the, um, the main living space. And finally, <clears throat> light, uh, again, orientation to the sun was all important. Uh, producing light means that you're needing to create energy um, and use energy, and they this wasn't an option for people in uh, colonial times, so orientation to maximize the sun and its rays was, was always uh, paramount, rather than positioning to meet the road. And once uh, mechanical systems began to be used, um, even the addition of pair of chimneys in architecture, um, windows began to expand accordingly. So with later Georgian and federal um, buildings, you begin to see much bigger windows. And certainly by the time Victorian um, buildings were being constructed, Victorian era buildings were being constructed, you saw a number of bays and uh, just really large floor to ceiling windows that would um, maximize the light in rooms. Well, and that's the historic part. That's it. <laughs> Thanks, Stacey. So I guess we're done. Uh, good job, everybody. Take all of that and go home. And there you go. You own a historic home. There's your answer. That is exactly that's right. How do you make it more efficient? It already is. Um, so that being said, yes, there are inherent characteristics and properties from different um, homes that are built in different periods that you can capitalize on. Um, but how do we make a house more efficient? We have to start with the plans. Because yes, we can take one or two or little pieces there, but if we really want to get a holistic look at how we can improve it, we need to create a single plan. And in order to create that plan, we need to set our goals. So any house, new or old, is a system. The parts all work together. Sometimes they work together effectively. Sometimes they work together ineffectively. So it's important to remember this when we're thinking what it is you want to accomplish by making your home more efficient. So for most people, that would be lowering their energy costs by reducing the amount of energy they expend. In a house built prior to 1950, it is generally possible to improve energy efficiency by 30 to 40 percent. For others, it is simply the idea of using existing resources to reduce the amount of waste that ends up in landfills. It takes an estimated 20 to 30 years for a new building to compensate for the energy expended for its construction. Um, and I also just learned a recent fact that's going to end up in a plan of, of one town who's taking this very seriously, is that in that amount of time for you to recoup that, all those materials that you have put into your uh, building have reached the end of their lifespan and now need to be replaced. So the cycle starts all over again. Um, most historic buildings have already expended that several times over the average lifespan for materials before they need to be substantially repaired or replaced is approximately 100 years. So, and for some people, 
Their goals for improving energy efficiency includes keeping characteristics of the house that they love. The windows, the doors, the shutters, radiators, things that, may, that they may have been told would need to be replaced in order to make their house green. And that is simply not the case. There are many ways to go about improving energy efficiency in a home, and there's a lot of information offered. For historic homes, the goal is to improve energy efficiency while maintaining a home's historic integrity. And as each resource is unique, it's important to know your home before you prescribe a treatment. So as we all know, historic properties come in many varieties, exhibiting different character-defining features. Something is character-defining, National Park Service definition, if it is a visual aspect or physical feature that comprises the appearance of a historic building. Character-defining elements include the overall shape of the building, its materials, its craftsmanship, decorative details, interior spaces and features, as well as the various aspects of its site and its environment. You may realize that that definition I just said are all the things that Stacy said sometimes have inherent sustainability. So this is a photo of 14 Charter Road Place, a contributing resource to the Charter Road Place Historic District in Hartford. It is a two and a half story frame house built in 1876 for Charles H. Northend, a flower merchant. And based on what I just said, this audience participation, you don't have to participate if you don't want to. If you give me five seconds of silence, I'll say the answer. Um, so what would be considered some character defining features just looking at this close up photo? What sort of things do you think make this house this house? Bay windows. Bay windows, okay. What else? Nice gable over the window with the... Yeah, okay, yeah. The tower. The tower, the godly tower, absolutely. Anything else? Well, that under the windows, that little roof-like thing that goes over the lower windows. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of decorative elements. The decorative elements? How about just the, the, the siding? That clapper? Is that, is that character defining? That's 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 what makes up the majority of that house, right? Exactly, and all of that decorative wooden trim, right? All of these things are can be considered character defining. So, and as Stacy mentioned, I'm going to go through these a little bit quick, but again, just kind of wanted to reinforce it in your mind. Some character defining features, while historically important, are practical. So, um, a great example. So. The shutters, what did Stacy say that the shutters helped to do? The heat and cool. Too cool, right? Yeah. Or to, or to keep the heat in. Yep, and shield interior spaces from the sun and while allowing the breeze to pass through. Deep covered porches, right? We saw them in old line. Steep, dark colored roofs with little overhang are characteristic to many 18th century New England houses because of their ability to effectively shed snow and attract heat for warmth. Uh, as fuel was an ever pressing concern for people who had previously been accustomed to rainy winters, homes were designed to maximize heat retention from the roof line to the plant. So where is that chimney in these 18th century spaces? In the middle, exactly. So that allows heat to radiate out to each room. Uh, and the vestibule is also a tool of temperature regulation, which is an intermediary space between the outside and the inside. It catches all that cold air. I don't know, did anybody ever, did anybody grow up in a house that had a, a vestibule and you got yelled at for keeping that interior door open? Because I did. <laughs> uh, the siding of a residence and treatment of the lot was important. Northern elevations typically had few windows, planted with coniferous trees. And deciduous trees that shaded the house in the summer allowed solar heat in winter. Um, perhaps the most obvious passive energy feature um, that many people have in their homes, I have in my homes, but I don't think we use them as much as we should, are double hung windows. Uh, we saw that picture of everybody in New Haven hanging out of their windows. Uh, hot seventh grade science question, does hot air rise or fall? Rise. It rises, absolutely. <coughs> so the main, so the, the basically the double hung windows allow for each sash to operate independently. And lowering the upper sash and raising the lower sash allows air to come in and circulate out. Um, not in a residential setting, but I did just see something when I was at an industrial site um, where they had designed these brand new, beautiful uh, steel, uh, steel frame windows that automatically opened the exact amount of the upper sash, uh, upper sash 
as it did from the lower mount, uh, from the lower sash, and they were trying to trademark it. Uh, <laughs> but it was used in a catalog that it was an example of a cutting edge, modern, healthy work environment. That this allowed for the air to circulate, and so it was a comfortable environment for your employees to, to go to work in. Um, so de facto air conditioning. Um, So, <laughs> so, if we, so with features like these, it is entirely possible to improve a home's energy efficiency without adversely impacting its historic fabric. Some of the most effective energy improvement techniques are reversible, and as an added bonus, relatively inexpensive. Um, but before making any changes, it's a good idea to schedule an energy audit, um, which will help determine where energy is being lost. Part of the energy assessment will be a lower door diagnostics pressurize the house and help determine where air and energy is being lost. The main benefit to an energy audit is to establish a baseline for energy performance so that any changes can be evaluated for their effectiveness. It's also important to prepare for an energy audit ahead of time as it will include the entirety of the structure added to basement. So keep the following things in mind. Um, so I'm not going to read these for you, um, but most of these is because of the blower door test and it's meant to prevent anything hazardous from being circulated through the house. Um, the energy auditor will also ask questions to help determine any specific areas of concern you may have. So you may want to familiarize yourself uh, with such, such things as the year your house was built, its total square footage, the age of your appliance and utilities, and if you notice any hot or cold spots. Sorry, for energy audit was. So usually the results of an energy audit offer some immediate simple ways to improve efficiency, and one that doesn't impact the house at all, and should be the first step, and I hope most people have already done this by now, is to replace incandescent bulb with LEDs. Um, even in homes where lighting may play an important part to the feeling of spaces, new advances in lighting provides for a variety of brightness settings, color temperatures, you can turn them on now by scheduling it. If you want to use your phone, you can turn them on by remote control. Um, it's, it's really, and, and you will actually see a demonstrable difference. And that's just the easiest thing. Um, another is to simply conserve electricity by turning things off when they're not in use, or installing timers, or if your house is controlled by Google or Alexa, you can control exactly where these things turn on and off. Um, I used to do this presentation on Zoom, and um, people did not believe me when I said I did not have any lights on in my house <laughs> at, at 2 o'clock. Uh, I live in an 1874 uh, Italian egg house, and as Stacy gave you an example of those large windows, I have very large windows. Uh, and during the day, I turn my lights off uh, because that is absolutely enough light that comes in uh, through the different spaces in my house. I put my office in a room that gets a lot of light uh, during the majority of the work day. Um, another easy to do is to regulate thermostats, either by reducing heating and cooling by a degree or two. I told you some of these things you're not going to like. Uh, <laughs> or programming thermostats uh, for when you are home and when you are away. For plumbing, fixing leaks and insulating pipes are some of the easiest methods to eliminate energy waste. Um, once a baseline is established, a homeowner can begin to plan for interventions for a variety of methods. I'm going to quickly go through all these methods and point out ways a homeowner can improve energy efficiency on their own and treatments that will require professional assistance. Um, so, air sealing. Correcting air leaks provides one of the greatest returns on investment. It's inexpensive and, if done correctly, reversible. Air leaks can account for anywhere between 5 and 40% of human cooling costs, so it's important to detect where, is, where air is entering and exiting. The lower door test is part of the energy audit, it detects air leaks. Homeowners can also test for leaks themselves using a candle or a smoke, smoke test. Um, I did try that myself, and it didn't. Uh, I, I was not able to get a, a good reading, so it never worked. <laughs> but but you can try it and see if, see if it works for you. I, I lower door test. The, blow, the lower door test does work. Um, so air leaks are usually found in the following areas, and here's just a list from the exterior, um, corners, faucets, joists. Uh, joint between the foundation and siding, door and window frames, uh, interior, um, there's more spaces in the interior, attic doors and hatches, attic and basement floor, 
floors, uh, where chimneys are, uh, vents, lots of vents. Uh, if you ever had something installed pretty quick, there's, there's going to be some air leaks around those vents. Uh, corners and areas where the floors, walls, and roofs meet. Um, it's places where um, floors may have settled over time. You, you know, you may notice that between your baseboard and your floor, there's a gap. There are certain spaces in my house. Window frames, door frames, fireplace dampeners, wall or window mounted air conditioners, phone line connections. As you can see, this list goes on and on. There's a lot of different things that you may not have thought about where could I be losing energy, but they're all in these little small, later, I want to put a majority of later additions or things that have occurred to the house over time. Um, and things that have occurred when people weren't thinking about energy efficiency. So when sealing air leaks, material is important. The goal from a preservation standpoint is to have it be reversible. Uh, latex caulking is uh, often the most inexpensive user-friendly option, and as a bonus, can be it. Um, spray foam is sometimes recommended for sealing spaces, but it is not uh, preservations uh, friendly, uh, which is not reversible. Uh, it can stain, it does off-gas, um, and it can mask other problems if you install too much, like mold. Um, so usually the most effective areas to seal are the attic and the basement, both places where the majority of the air enters and leaves the house. Uh, other places to seal include around the windows and doors, which can be accomplished with weather stripping, um, which I'll talk a little bit about when I discuss windows. Um, and it's also important to remember that the goal is to reduce the amount of air filtration while allowing the house to breathe, as it was designed to, as uh, Stacey alluded to, about you know uh, ins insulation over time. And so a lot of house to breathe and avoid accumulating moisture that could lead to other serious conditions. Um, and so here we are, an insulation. <laughs> okay, so everybody talks about insulation. And it's like, oh, it's a good thing. Insulation is a good thing. What is the goal of insulation? Like, why, why are you putting it in there? To keep things warm? Yeah. To keep things warm, to keep things cool, to slow down the transfer of heat. Right? As Stacy said, you know, most houses were not insulated or insulated with some crazy things like shoes prior to 1940 um, or brick nogging. So insulation is commonly written today by an R factor, that resistance to transferring heat. The higher number, the better it insulates. As with air leaks, there are areas within historical homes that are good places to start to insulate. And in many homes, these places may have already been insulated. Uh, so they include the basement, the attic, pipes, and ducts. The benefit of starting here is that there are typically no historic finishes in these areas um, that can be disturbed. There are a variety of insulation materials to choose from, each with different R values and different applications. As with air ceilings, spray foams are not reversible and should not be used on historic fabric. Um, also, like air sealing, there is a question of moisture buildup when insulating a structure. As heat is not passing as easily through the structure, exterior materials remain colder and wetter for longer, which may lead to more maintenance and or deterioration. Um, a lot of people who have insulated their homes and have painted clapboard may notice that the, the paint, uh, they, they, they feel their paint starts to peel a lot quicker than it had in the past, and so they are doing more excessive painting. Or if you even put your hand up to, um, to some of the exterior cladding, it may feel damp. Um, with the spray foam, uh, actually, I'm just going to go into the wall. So this, um, that chart is in our um, document, um, Energy Efficiency for Historic Homes. So if you want to actually look at it more and actually see what the R values and applications are, um, rather than, you know, I'm not going to read it out to you now. Um, so the question of wall insulation. This is a grainy photo, but I kept it because it's from my house. Uh, the question of wall insulation of a historic home is problematic, as something has to be removed to allow for that insulation. Uh, this, depending on the type of insulation, could be a small cut to plaster, if we're dealing with interior walls, uh, removal of exterior shingles or clapboards, or, and not recommended, the entire removal of wall finishes. Um, so if too much, and, and in addition to that, if too much insulation is added uh, to an existing wall cavity, plaster wall systems can fail, uh, evidenced by broken keys or lats. So that is a picture of my den, um, where um, the interior of the wall um, expanded and it cracked 
all the cluster keys. Um, and so what they did is they put up some really groovy 1970s uh, fake wood veneer uh, siding. And that was the only room in the, uh, in the house that did not have the plaster walls. And so you knew something was wrong and you didn't really want to peek behind that siding, but you had to anyway. Uh, <laughs> so I did, and that's what I discovered, um, is that basically the plaster wall system had failed um, in many spots. And so um, what, what I ended up doing is I actually did have, because it was settled in one, one area of the room more than others, I had some cracks, but it did look like um, when I put a scope in there, it did look like the majority of um, some of the walls were okay and they could be kind of patched. But there was one section of wall that I, I just had someone replaster the wall. Um, that not everybody has to do that. I just felt like I, I really needed to, to walk the walk um, when I'm giving this talk. <laughs> <laughs> so um, additionally, wood frame structures often contain a wall cavity that helps you keep interior wall systems dry. Adding insulation can sometimes cause unintentional moisture problems in rock. Um, so as Stacy mentioned, you know, with, sometimes with that blown in cellulose insulation, when it um, collects moisture and the moisture collects in the wall cavity, that, um, that cellulose will drop to the bottom and you will get, you know, somewhere between like a foot and like two feet of this really wet insulation that now creates a very damp, wet area in the house. Um, and the only way to fix that is that you have to remove it, you take it out, and you have to let everything dry out, but there may have been, um, you know, mold instances that happen um, when you leave it like that. Um, in the case of masonry structures, wall insulation can keep materials wetter for longer, similar moisture problems, or material deterioration. Um, okay, now let's get to the next section, and it's a whole section. <laughs> next slide. Windows. So one of my favorite parts, and the part where we get the most questions, are windows. So windows are the eyes to the soul of the building. You can learn a lot about a building just by looking at its windows. Um, I love windows. Um, I stop traffic sometimes if I see interesting windows. They tell a lot about a building and they are one of the most obvious and important character defining features. Um, so in addition to the cultural value that they hold, historic windows offer a number of benefits. They are made, they are often made of quality materials by a quality craftsman. They are repairable multiple times. They are custom made for your house and they provide an aesthetic quality that new windows oftentimes just can't match. Um, so, if all this is true, why do so many houses have replacement windows? Um, if you can't read the cartoon, I really like this cartoon, and it says 1901 Oak Park, Frank Lloyd Wright leads another unsuspecting aluminum siding salesman to his basement. Um, a much, much like that aluminum siding salesman would walk down the street going door to door and he would walk through a uh, neighborhood and you'd be like, Jerry's been here. <laughs> um, you, it, and you can see it now too with metal roofs. I don't know if you guys have noticed the uptick in people putting metal roofs on and you can just kind of see as you walk down the street, uh, previously in the 90s it was vinyl. You could, if you walked through a neighborhood, you could suddenly see all the houses had vinyl and you could see where you know he got out of his car and took his kit and walked through the neighborhood and, and now it's, you know, now it's metal roofs, right? Um, window salesmen have, have a great pitch when they approach you. Um, so these are just some, some quotes, right? So they, they give you the pitch. Uh, your old windows are shabby, they're not energy efficient, you have aluminum storms on them, those aren't very appealing either. Our windows are approved by the local historic commission. I hate that one. Um, often not true. Often I not true. <laughs> often, maybe one line of their replacement windows are, but not the not, not, not the ones they're selling. Um, so it's possible that this type of scenario contributes to the number of homes that have replacement windows. Um, this pitch was made to me a couple of years ago um, because I have windows that are built to my house. Uh, all of those statements sound reasonable. Um, I 
And if they were approved by the local historic district commission, that sounds pretty good, right? You know, they care. Um, but if you don't know the facts about replacement windows, how would you counter that when someone approaches you? Um, and there are count there are counters to those statements, um, which is they may not be new, but they work. Uh, a properly weatherized window with storm functions like a new insulated window. Uh, aluminum storms are effective, do not require any major investment if they are already there, are environmentally friendly, and protect the historic windows. That's what I told the window salesman, and he just kept saying, Local Historic District Commission. And I said, Thank you very much for your time. <laughs> um, and basically, when it comes down to the base of it, new windows are not the same quality of the original windows. The wood that they are made out of, if you're doing true wood replacement windows, is less dense. They, can, they provide comparable energy efficiency to the existing windows at a significant cost. Each unit has a finite lifespan and is not repairable, which means it goes in the trash at the end of that lifespan. They are not custom made to match the existing windows in material, size, munting profile. They tell you it is, but it's not custom. It's custom out of 10 choices, and you can mix them all together, but they're not custom. Uh, and finally, replacing your windows, if we're going to talk about it in the National Park Service way, can adversely impact the historic integrity of your property. So basically, at the end of the day, those new windows are inferior to the one that you already have. Uh, thank you. So that all being said, replacement windows are the last resort. They're there to replace what's been lost. So if you have windows that are in good shape or need repairs, you don't need to replace them. And you know, when people tell you that you should replace them for sustainability sake or energy efficiency, as Stacy mentioned, if your windows are not the majority of your of your elevation or your plane of, of, of the facade or any or secondary elevations, that's not where you're losing your energy. As I mentioned earlier, you're losing your energy through air infiltration up and out. So I'd be saying, oh, it's going to improve your energy. It will, but by a very small amount. That's not really where you're losing it. And that's, again, why the audit's important, to see where am I losing this. Um, so, sustain, yes. So a single pane double hung wood window, um, and this is, a fact, this is a recent fact, has an approximate R value of 1. A double pane insulated double hung window has an R value of 3. So if you're trying to achieve a, a greater energy savings, that's not that big of a difference. So one of the main benefits of retaining your historic windows is the practicality of repair. Almost any element can be fixed. Contemporary windows are units. They are a closed system. And once that is damaged, it's almost impossible to repair. You may have seen you know, where, the, where the, uh, the air seal loses in between the insulated panes, you have moisture infiltration, things like that. You can't really fix it. Um, Yes. Uh, and additionally, windows are almost always character defining. So these are a plethora of, of window types. Um, like I said, I, I stop and take photos of windows all the time. Uh, <laughs> and they're all indicative of different eras and styles. Um, yeah, 10 reasons. So this is a list of 10 reasons why it's a good idea to keep historic windows. But they're, uh, again, I'm not going to read them all. Uh, highlights more economical, better return on your investment. They're greener, they're functional, and they're absolutely unique. Um, I use an analogy, maybe this speaks about my driving habits, of a damaged car. Um, I don't know if anybody has ever gotten into um, an accident and, and they've had to replace a door or um, a panel or a quarter panel. They make replacements and it's made by the same manufacturer. Um, and it'll be professionally installed, but it will never quite fit like the original. Um, so what can you do to immediately improve the energy efficiency of your historic windows? Window drop stoppers. Insulated shades or curtains. That's what the, you know, that they, we, we already figured that out 200 years ago. Uh, rope caulk and window draft shields. And above all, general maintenance. Um, that's important. So you don't get to the point where you have to replace your, your windows. So paint your wood sashes. Um, spot fill, glazing putty. Keep your sashes sliding smoothly. Monitor your sash cords. If they're frayed, replace them if necessary. Um, 
There are more intensive energy efficiency measures, but these should probably be undertaken by a professional. Uh, they include things like metal weather stripping and storm windows. Um, both of these items need to be custom fitted for the best result. Uh, so it's good of you to get someone experience. Preservation Connecticut has a preservation directory of professionals sorted by category. Um, you can go to their website and you can check that out. Um, doors. Doors are similar to windows, um, but I don't think they're the eyes. I, I haven't figured out a good, a good metaphor for that yet. It's like a mouth, but I, I don't know. Um, in any case, the same reasons for keeping a syrup windows apply to doors. Better materials, custom fit, less waste, you need to your house. Um, slide, please. And people are going to suggest that you replace them. That's an actual mailer I got. Uh, <laughs> right? And look at that. Okay, I got 30 days to call. And by the way, my, you, you know, I'll, yeah, I'll just leave that there. Is that what your door looks like? No. <laughs> not, even, not, even, not even close. <laughs> um, the same treatments for windows. Uh, the same treatments for windows are similar for doors. Regular maintenance, painting, patching, uh, insulation of weather stripping. Um, there's also the option of a storm door, which is should be chosen carefully um, so as not to detract from the historic door. I am guilty of having a very unappealing storm door, um, but it works. Uh, but yes, I should get a much better storm door, more in the fact that I should um, also re-weather strip so that you can, again, improve that energy right from the outset. Um, HVAC. So I talked earlier about the inherent energy saving features that were built into historic homes because fuel sources were as plentiful and modern cooling didn't exist. Um, now that the systems do exist, many people have grown accustomed to them. And given also the discussion we had about insulation and moisture, again, here's the thing that people won't like. It's not the wisest idea to create an interior space that's 50 degrees when the outside temperature is 90 degrees. When I wrote this in my original script, I said this is hyperbole, but I don't think that's true anymore given the, la given the weather from the last couple weeks. Uh, the principle, the general principle though, is, is the same. It's possible to create climate controlled spaces in historic homes, but it's unrealistic and for the, the historic fabric of the house, undesirable to expect to create a hermetically sealed environment with each back um, for, for a historic home. Uh, there are systems that do closed systems for large, like industrial spaces where it's possible. It's very complicated because you, you basically build a box within a box. And there are people that do that um, and things like historic mills. That's not really the, the point of this conversation. Um, and the idea is, again, this historic fabric is designed to breathe. So there are improvements you can make, but it's, if you're expecting to create a bubble and zip yourself in, that's not, that's not really going to work. Um, what should be desired and expected is to integrate a system into a home by utilizing its inherent climate control characteristics coupled with new reversible technology. Um, generally, installing new pipes or ductwork um, should be evaluated against the infrastructure you already have in place. If you already have, so, so as an example, right, the furnace shown is a natural gas furnace hot water heater connecting to existing radiators. It's my house. Um, <laughs> the only major change to improve the efficiency here was to remove the oil burning furnace and the conventional hot water tank. Uh, in regards to cooling, where there's no existing ductwork, high velocity mini ducts are an option. Um, I have seen them too far between. I have not seen them um, more than, than I, I guess I would have liked to have seen them. Um, they're smaller and flexible ductwork compared to traditional, and so it requires less intervention into historic fabric. Um, and if it's only seasonal cooling, because we're in a place where there are four seasons, um, room air conditioners, which can vent through a small tube out a window, or uh, or room air conditioners you can actually move around, which is what I have. I have two of those, one for upstairs, one for downstairs, um, are more effective at cooling, and they don't damage any historic fabric. Um, so you actually don't, you know, window units, people use them. I use the room air conditioner because I actually can move it around as I need to, and I can move it from space to space, and it vents out a little small vent at the bottom of the window sash. And you can place it wherever you need it. Um, so we talked about all the ways to conserve energy, sweaters. Um, 
Now let's talk about some alternative sources. A significant question when it comes to energy efficiency is the introduction of solar, as it has both detractors and supporters. A typical residential solar installation relies on solar voltaic panels that are usually installed in a roof, but that also be installed in the ground onto the red. Solar installations have the possibility to negatively impact above and below ground resources. So therefore, where you place them is key. General guidance is that panels, if installed on buildings, should be placed on a non-public facing slope, usually on either the side or the rear. That photo on the right is Preservation Connecticut headquarters. And they get a green check mark if they're right. <laughs> um, or so you said they should be they should not be where? They should not face the public facing right away. Uh -huh. So if you look at the one on the left, all those panels are right up there. I see. That's, that's not the best spot to put them. Now, obviously, we're looking at two different ones. And we have one that's ridgeline to the street, and we have one that's gable end to the street. But the idea is the same. Or if you don't uh, want to place them on the main structure, you can place them on a non historic structure, like an addition, if you have an addition, or a non historic outbuilding. Um, and then also ground mounted. So there are also ground mounted arrays, you know, for people that have a lot of land and they have fields and that they have fallow fields and they're not using them, it's just green space, um, you can do a ground mounted array. They should be placed in an area that will not disrupt a scenic view. Um, and the area, if not already disturbed in a soil context, should be evaluated for its potential to contain archaeological deposits. Um, so that's something just to consider if you're doing ground mounted solar arrays. But again, that's not that's not really what the typical homeowner is looking at. They're usually looking at placing it on their house or an addition or an outbuilding. Um, renewable energy, geothermal pumps. Um, they are another possible option for renewable energy for homes. They rely on the Earth's constant temperature for heating and utilize less energy than conventional furnace systems. Uh, like ground mounted solar arrays, the area of installation should be evaluated for archaeological sensitivity before installation. And then we have other sources. There are other types of renewable energy, including wind power, hydropower, biomass fuels. Um, they are typically outside the realm of a single homeowner, but our guide also includes information on each type. Some people, like you know, have little um, small windmills that generate energy for whatever for they for what they need. You know, some people do have that lot of land, and they can go through that process to get it. You know, it's not a lot of energy, but I have seen it happen. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so above all. It is important to remember that technology is ever evolving and that elements introduced into a structure may soon become obsolete and need to be removed or cause unforeseen conditions. So, this, this is an example <laughs> of a boiler. Um, Many homes were built with this type of boiler, furnace, very large industrial, um, very large in industrial piece of machinery, right? That makes sense. And this is a space in my home where the oil furnace was, and a photo of my current furnace. Um, my home actually had three different types of furnace. It was built with a coal furnace, um, and then it was replaced with a oil furnace. Uh, and then it was replaced with this nice little, uh, nice little combo unit. Um, because of this, so this is a major change, right? I've gone from a very large furnace to a medium-sized oil burning furnace to a very small combo unit furnace. Now that, for me, has decreased a lot of my energy use and has decreased the cost of my heating bill. So that's a big change. Can I ask you a question? Sorry, sure. So that's heating water. It's it's heating. Uh, yes. So it's heating. So, so I guess the benefit is if you have a big tank and you're keeping it, if you're keeping it hot when you don't need it, so that's a lot of wasted energy. So with a, with a conventional hot water yes, heater. Sure. Yes. So sometimes they have tanks. So so this is a combo unit that's a, a furnace tankless hot water heater. But they also make if your furnace is separate, they also make tankless hot water heaters. And the same sort of thing. It takes an awful lot of energy to boil that up and then hold it, and then right. it cools down a little bit and then it blows up again. Um, so tankless hot water heaters allow for that water to be heated as it goes. Um, so yes, that does reduce it, uh, water waste and uh, heating costs. Right. Um, so anyway, so because this was in the basement, there was no historic fabric damage when I made this big change, right? So that's the name of the game, right? We want reversibility. We don't want to impact historic fabric. 
Um, thanks a lot. <laughs> so I just saw this uh, last month, so I haven't even actually included it in our presentation. This is a church in the north end of Hartford. Um, are those great? Yeah, I thought it was a modern art installation for a minute. Um, <laughs> but that is not what it is. Those are those, <laughs> those are vents. <laughs> That's some ductwork. That is some ductwork that is going down to those very large, uh, those very large, and I don't even know if it's heating or cooling. I guess it's cooling. Um, I guess they're condensers, or whatever they are. So if you'll notice, what happened is they have made interventions, some in the windows, some above the windows, to get in whatever interior space they're trying to get. So they've punched holes in that elevation of the building. Um, and then the next slide. And then here's one that's more of a residential. This is a, you know, it's an apartment building, but as you can see by the orange um, squares, uh, they basically just cut holes wherever they, wherever they felt they needed to put that air conditioner. Um, they were made for a very specific unit. And once that unit wears out, like my furnace did, what replaces it? Do you make another, do you make another intervention? You can't put it back. Uh, so historic fabric has been lost for the sake of a 30, Let's be, I'm being generous, your clients. Um, my house was here long before me, uh, and hopefully it will be here long after me. I am a steward of a historic property. I enjoy my house. I also have a responsibility to care for it, just like you have a responsibility to care for yours. And I'm sure you also love your house, and you want to care for it. And like many of you, I also feel a responsibility to be sustainable. Uh, and luckily, being sustainable and being historic go hand in hand. So, just to wrap up as a summary, before embarking on energy upgrades, remember the following. Decide what you want to accomplish. Understand the historic character of your home. Evaluate the current conditions of your home. And create a holistic plan that is primarily reversible and can be evaluated for how effective it is. And so there's so much more to read about sustainability in our handbook, which you can find on our website. We also have additional um, information specifically about windows, which everybody uh, wants to read about. Um, and we have additional guidance from the National Park Service, but these are just jumping off points. Um, so I hope you found this helpful. And if you have any questions, we are at the bag end. That was an Lord of the Rings pun. And thank you. What's your website's uh, What's your website's name? Uh, it's the top one. Go back. So it's um, C. So it's ctgov backslash historic preservation. I have a question. Uh, it seems like a lot of what you're referring to is sort of a an idealized uh, case where there's an original building that you want to respect and, and be true to. But it seems like in real life, I mean, Cornwall's a great example. It doesn't, didn't start with a big bang. It was sort of developed over time, styles changed. It's, it's not like they necessarily were butchering it. Maybe there were some better materials that were used. Some things were recycled, even in mine. I have a house from 1800 that has beams that were obviously not originally cut for that house, but were recycled from something else. And is there room in your vision for like changes that aren't, you know, are we, are we being true to something that maybe is a kind of a false, uh, you know, premise? Like, what do you have against metal roofs, for instance? <laughs> So I think what we're talking about is one of those slides when we were talking about integrity. So when we evaluate integrity, we're not talking about, to your point, it just, it just auto-generated into being. Buildings change over time. And buildings can acquire significance over time. So when you're evaluating a building, you're evaluating why it's significant and what those character-defining features are. So later additions may be character-defining. A great example is an 1800s house that then has an 1890s porch on it. We wouldn't rip that off. Yeah. And so there's a way to definitely evaluate that. Um, the idea about the metal roofs um, is that when we're talking about the historic character, let's say an 1800s house, that's an incompatible material. Okay. Because they would not have had that material 
for that house. Now, if you have, let's say, a metal roof, um, and these are very, um, you know, and, and they're much more prevalent in different parts of the country, but let's say you have very good because there was a tin roof salesman that well, went that, down that's the thing that It depends right? on the type of building. So, so, it's, yeah. so it goes back to that point is what is my resource? Yeah. Yeah. So what are you and, and, and that's the thing too is that <laughs> you have to make the argument for it, in other words, so you could see it. Well and also, you know, I'm giving you the best guidance. You know, I'm giving you the guidance that the National Park Service would give, that SHIPO would give, the technical advice that we would give if we're talking about what is the best thing you could possibly do. What is that platinum car wash, right? But we're also people, and people have to evaluate what is best for them when they need to. But what's important is that you have all that information before you make that decision, which is why we always recommend know your resource, know what you're dealing with, know why it's significant, know those character-defining features, and then know what current conditions you have. And then based off that actual information you have, then you can make informed decisions. And everybody has to make a decision that's right for them. Um, what is probably the right thing for my house is to have wooden storms manufactured, right? And to have new wooden storms that are nice and insulated and have and have them put in front of my, my beautiful two over two, very large, double hung windows, right? Right now, they have 1970s turbo track loaded storms. They are working. <laughs> they, they are working. They have protected my windows. Is that the platinum? Is it, you know, is it the platinum car wash? No, it's not the platinum car wash. But right now, for me as a homeowner, that is what is working for me. Because it's reversible. You could and at some absolutely. later time absolutely. get some custom storms built in that would look more authentic. Absolutely. So to continue the point, so the, the, the part about the metal roof is an aesthetic question. It's not an energy question. No, it's not an energy question. Okay. So I, I, I agree mostly what you're talking about. It, things are very complicated. And I think for the average person, it's very hard for them to sort through this decision-making process. So I think if there was some, if your office had a, a lot more detailed presentation, and this is great for this short presentation, but I, I don't know if your office has considered doing something on a, on a deeper basis that homeowners could look at. You know, it might be 200 pages, but as Michael was saying, like the windows in your house, like I have a house from 1817, but the windows were from 1950s maybe. Mm -hmm. So they're, I mean, yes, they're 60s, they're 73 years old now, but I don't consider them historic and not necessarily worth preserving. So, you know, we may go for new windows. So, and I, I, that's different. That's, yeah, it's that's different. different. So I'm just saying everything yeah. is complicated, and yeah. I just, I just want. I think it's important to separate the mechanical parts from the the historical parts, which is very important. And the reversibility is a very clear thing. Good so I mean, like the gentleman asked the question about hot water heaters. That's a really complicated question because it's a question of how much money you want to spend because the instantaneous hot water is very expensive. And a regular hot water tank is not very expensive. And it depends where, if it's stored in a cold basement, it's going to lose a lot of heat. If it's stored in a, in a conditioned space, it's not going to lose a lot of heat. If there's 10 people using it, it doesn't make much difference. If there's only two people using it, it might make a difference. So these are, these are all really complicated questions. They are. They so are. I just think it's important that people understand so you may have how come complicated it is. So you may have come in late, um, but we have a, um, a guide for homeowners that are we do. on our website. Okay. I'd like to look. Yeah. question about lighting. The uh, incandescence of fan, right? Yeah. Above a certain wattage. I thought they were having a fog right there. So, um, I know they're halogens or not. Are halogens that type yeah. of LED? <laughs> or they're just totally different from other things? Probably different, right? I don't think they exist. Yeah, I don't think they exist. I think they're few and far between now. Yeah. I think oh, they're very far between. I think everything gets kind of blurry too. <laughs> I see it. There, there was an energy, there was an early attempt at energy efficiency, and again, the idea of reversibility because you don't really know where that technology is going to go. There was an early attempt at this kind of energy efficiency, um, which I think was those, those halogens, and then they kind of phased them out, and now we're into the LEDs. Like I don't know if you remember the, the light bulbs that had those tubes in them. Right. Yeah. yeah, those are gone. Um, you're not really supposed to use them anymore. Um, 
The Green Bank uh, has a number of people that are qualified to evaluate the space through that lower door test and, um, you know, ask away. We have a kind of card here, you can contact yes. us and, or... And, and, something, and, and something I, I did not mention um, in the presentation is that there are, especially for things where, you know, you want to be sustainable, but there's a large upfront cost. Um, to some sort of interventions that you'd like to make. There are um, programs that are specifically designed for homeowners through organizations like the Connecticut Green Bank. That information is in our homeowners book, um, and it's also on our website. Um, they also do it for other purposes, but there is dedicated resources for homeowners like to do an energy audit and give you a list of recommendations um, so that, you know, if you are seriously considering these, but, you know, cost is a factor, um, you have some other resources to go to. And back to that metal roof, just one more thing. Mm -hmm. um, I had, a, I had a, a person come to me as a circuit rider. They had a barn, and it was a beautiful barn, very large, had a cedar roof, and it was going to be almost $100,000 to re-roof it. Yeah. And I said, go ahead and use the metal. <laughs> you know? So that's, it, it yeah. comes down to it. They, didn't have another option, you know, so that's what they did. And again, you know, and that's that's not so much an energy efficiency thing, we should not have No, but it's, <laughs> <up>. <laughs> but it's also, that's reversible. It is, it is reversible, and if the cedar had reached the end of its life span, uh, so you weren't removing any historic fabric that was, you know, in a repairable condition, right? Yeah. The, the cedar had already deteriorated, you needed to put something new on, and you were faced with two choices. And that was a practical choice that they made. But it was a big debate because the roof is a big character defining feature for a barn, right? Because there's much else. So. Well, and, and you know, but, and, and again, to that point, what, what was the risk if you didn't replace the roof? If you waited, right? Right. Do you want to lose the whole building? Do you want to lose the whole building? And so those, again, we are giving you ideal. Yeah. And then sometimes people have to be pragmatic. I am pragmatic in my own life. I really do try and walk that walk. Um, <laughs> And, and, and I try I try very hard, um, but I also understand that, you know, sometimes people are people and people have to make different choices. And so again, the idea is to just give you all the information possible so that you can make an informed decision that's best for you and your property. Yes? Did you define a circuit rider? That is a term with which I am very unfamiliar. So a circuit rider, is a term that I would like changed um, because I don't like it myself. But it means basically that I'm a field service technician. Thank you. So I'm just out in the field. Okay. People ask for my horses all the time. <laughs> sure. Well, it comes from the 19th century. Thank you very much for coming. This is terrific. Uh, this is Any designated property. No, and, and why is it? Why, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of upsides to being designated, sure. but the downside to the is it linear freedom and ability to uh, no. do stuff? Especially, no, especially. Right. Yeah. 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 Right.